All right, this is something that you may have done. I do it all the time. You go, has anybody seen my keys? Where is my keys? I put them right here. They were right here. Where are they gone? Who's taken my keys? And then you hear a voice and then, I saw them on the bench. And you go, oh yeah, I put them there. That's right, yeah. Or you go, you go, has anybody seen my glasses? Yeah, <laughs> Have you ever done that before? I've done it so many times. What about this one? Has anybody seen my faith? I had my faith last month and it's gone. Where is my faith? Somebody's removed my faith. Where's my faith gone? Are you only have faith? 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 Oh, there you are. Come on out, faith. Why are you shaking and trembling like that? Come on out. This morning's message is help. I'm losing my faith. You may think, well, what are you doing, David? You're preaching to believers. But the truth of the matter is, most of us, I would say probably all of us, go through some phase of our life where we get a little bit lost. Where we may doubt a few things and we start to think about things and we start feeling insecure about our faith. But you know, the proof is in the pudding. Here in this church and all the churches that I've been in, when commitments are made for Jesus Christ... Most of them are not first-time commitments. Most of them are recommitments. And while we value recommitments just as we do first-time commitments, it tells us something about the Christian faith that there is a waxing and a waning, there is a drifting and there is a drawing of faith in the Christian society. But we know that God desires more. We know that when we become Christians, we become babies. And the Apostle Paul says that you are on, you are on liquids when you're a baby in Christ. But then I want you to become on solids. I want you to start eating solids. I want you to start maturing. God wants us to mature to the point that we are leaning only on Him and not on the world. You know, many people will say, Non-Christians will say, show me the evidence of God and then I will believe. Show me that Jesus actually was resurrected and then I'll become a Christian right now in front of you. But there's something inherently wrong with that because we are not brought to faith by evidence and facts. We are brought to faith by something much more powerful than that, something much more evidential than that. We are brought to faith by the Holy Spirit that comes upon us and convicts us where it needs to convict and then pours out His great love for us and all of a sudden we begin to change. You see, you can't fake change. You can try and be kind for a week without, without Christ in your life, but you will eventually go back to your natural state and you will no longer be kind. But, but the evidence of Christ is that we are changing and becoming more like Jesus Christ. And people will see that if that's what's happening. But it's, it's normal to doubt. There's nothing wicked about doubting. In fact, many of the famous biblical people in the Bible doubted. I mean, what was Thomas's name? Doubting Thomas. Why? Well, I mean, think about it. He had every reason to doubt because he saw Jesus on the cross. He saw him die. He saw him go into the, like he saw with his eyes, he was buried. Like that's the normal thing. Like and now somebody was saying he's alive. It's, it's normal for, the, for people to doubt in that way. He says, I will not believe until I put my finger in it and the holes in his sides. And then Jesus is in front of him and says, come on, have a look. What, did she, what does Jesus say to doubting Thomas? He says, he says Thomas. You believe now because you've seen, but I want you to, but greater is he that believes without seeing. But doubt is part of our everyday walks. It's the flip side of the coin of faith. In fact, if there was no doubt in faith, in, in faith it wouldn't be called faith. It would be called fact. Is that not true? 
if God revealed himself today and, and, and landed here and said, here I am, I'm God, and removed all doubt that he was real, he would also be removing all freedom to love him. Because now we would be forced to love him because he is God. You see, God wants us to have faith in him without seeing. Because when he does come, all those who have had faith will receive him in a different light to when if you haven't had faith in him. There are many reasons why people wander off from faith. But if you think about it deeply, most of them will come back to the two reasons that Jesus gave us. In Jesus' parable of the seeds and the farmer who sows the seeds into different soil, soil being the heart of man, seeds being the gospel message, and the one who sows them, the one who brings the message. Jesus gives us two core reasons why people wander off from their faith. The first one is this. Someone with a stony soil. It's not so important why the, the stone is there, but what is important, because there is stone, the soil is shallow. Shallow hearts. A shallow heart is titivated by the message of Jesus Christ. Oh, that sounds so good. That's going to be so good for me. I'm going to be saved. We love the fact that we have a Savior, but we do not love the fact that He is our Lord. We want to accept the resurrection, but we don't so much want the cross. And so, the, and so Jesus says that when the sun comes out, the plant that is planted in the stony ground does not have a deep root because there are stones. And so the root is not strong enough or deep enough to sustain it when the sun comes out. When trouble comes to people with stony hearts, when persecution comes to people with stony hearts, they begin to wither and die because their roots in Christ are not deep enough and for the wrong reasons. The second reason is the one person is the person who has a weedy heart. A weedy heart. Somebody that cultivates weeds. Excuse me. Cultivating weeds. Jesus tells us exactly how and what the weeds are. In Mark 4, 19, it says, Maybe the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things, other things could be anything that you put above Jesus Christ, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The word is literally choked. The word is literally suffocated by the things that we run after. We get distracted by our inner desires, and it turns us into these people that become quite numb about Jesus Christ and our faith. Have you ever woken up in the morning and your arm has gone to sleep or something like that? And you get an itchy nose or something, and you, and you're like, you want to scratch your skin, and you get this. And then because you're half asleep, you're like, what's that on my face? And somebody's attacking me and, you, and you're trying to, you know, get the person off you, but your arm's not moving at all. And then you realize, oh, okay, she's gone to sleep. That's exactly what happens when we become numb to Christ. We become useless. We do not produce fruit. Their hearts have valued other things higher than that of Christ. A farmer tells a story. He says, I live in a small rural community. There are a lot of cattle ranches around here, and every once in a while, a cow wanders off and gets lost. Ask a rancher how a cow gets lost, and, he'll chances, and chances he will reply, well, the, car, the cow 
starts nibbling on a tuft of green grass. When it's finished, its eye finds another tuft of green grass and it nibbles on that and then it nibbles on another one and then it nibbles right next to the fence and when it's finished that it sees another green patch right on the other side of the fence. So he finds a hole and he goes and nibbles on that one and so he goes and eventually he nibbles himself to being lost, completely lost. This morning I believe God wants to speak to the heart of his people. You might be sitting here thinking, well, I, you know, I don't know if this message is for me because at the end of the day, I'm feeling strong. I'm feeling good in my faith. Well, then use it to help somebody who is not. Because that's what we should be doing, right? We should be encouraging others. It's not, faith is not just about me. It's about a community of believers and the kingdom of God. How do, how do we deal with people that are, are drifting away? Do we judge them or do we help them? And do we know how to help them? You might also be sitting here thinking, I recognize what he's saying. I have been drifting. I'm not as passionate as I used to be when I first found Jesus Christ. I know that there are other things that are drawing me away. And I am in church today, but I know deep in my heart that God wants more from me. He wants more love from me. If that's you, then this message is for you this morning. Turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 12. 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 12. It's a very short piece of passage of Scripture, but it is powerful. And it's a piece of Scripture that God will use to show us how we deal with ourselves if we're drifting and with others when we are falling away from Christ. 1 Timothy 6, 11, 12. The Apostle Paul, just while you're finding it, the Apostle Paul is, is, is speaking to Timothy, who is a new pastor, going to be pastoring a church. And, and in his eyes, he's a young man. I think, he's, I think the scholars say he's in his late 30s. For us, that's not too young. But in those days, that was very young for, a, for somebody leading a church or, or, um, or a priest. And, and the Apostle Paul knows that because he's young, he may be anointed, he may be called, but he has no experience in leading church. And so the whole of the, 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 book, the letter of Timothy is, is trying to help him deal with the issues of the church. And this particular one is dealing with the issues of the heart that we chase after other things and causes us to wander off. Let's read together. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. How does the Apostle Paul start this, this conversation with Timothy? He starts with identity. Identity is so important. He says to him, but you... Man of God. But you, man of God. Not but you, Timothy. But you, man of God. He's, de he's, he's, he's strategically defining who he is. You know, sometimes we, um, or most of the times, when we identify ourselves, when you're meeting somebody new and you're having a conversation, how often do we say, what do you do? So what do you do? What work do you do? It's like, it's, like, it's like the first thing we say. Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I do a bit of plastering, I do a bit of this and I better do that, you know, and I'm pretty proud of myself. That's what I do. That's my identity. That's how I wrapped up. But you know what? God does not identify you by the works that you do. He identifies you by the rest that you do. We have to change the identity of who we are. When the, when the, when the Israelites were released from captivity and going to the promised land, God called it the rest. 
Because those that did not make it, who had disobeyed God, he said, they will not enter into my rest. And they all died in the desert. Is that right? In Hebrews, it tells us what that actually means. It tells us that today there's a day of rest. What does he mean? He means coming into faith with Jesus Christ. While grace is still upon us, you enter into rest. When you have faith, you are in rest. You are in Sabbath. And so God identifies us not by our works, but by our rest. Your identity is not that you married. It's not how many kids you've got. It's not what work you do, what car you drive, where you live. That's not your identity. Your identity is who you are in Jesus Christ. Who are you? A while ago, a um, number of years ago, when we first moved to Springfield Lakes area, we felt called to come here, and we felt called to come to a particular church. I'm not going to say which church, which pastor, but we went to one of those evenings where you get to know the pastor and get to know the elders and the vision of the church, right? And while we were there, um, he had a coffee machine. It was in his house, and he had a coffee machine. And we had, I've got one, I had one in the same work, and I knew how it worked. And he, and he was complaining about something not working. And I said, oh, that's fine. I can fix it. And that was good, but the problem is that whenever I saw him for months after that, he used to call me the coffee man. And I was like, and I got, I, I, honestly, I got a little bit, I got annoyed. Why are you calling me the coffee man? That's not who I am. That's not my identity. I'm not the coffee man. Hey, coffee man! Cool. And, then, and then, you know, like, I, do, you, do you see what I'm saying about identity, how important it is? And so... When we had a, like our final meeting with him, because we knew we were called to the church in spite of being a coffee man, and I, and, I, and I was like, okay, we had the meeting, and as I walked through the door, he said, come on, coffee man, and I just, I, I think I was rude at the, at the end of the day, I probably was rude, I said, pastor, please, I hope that in the coming months you're going to see more in me than a coffee man, because I'm not just a coffee man, and then I met Pastor Paul, and the first thing Pastor Paul always said to me, hello, man of God, and I went, that's it, that's who I am, not because I'm something great or a man of faith, it's because it said something within me that inspired me to be the man of God, I want to be that guy, I want to be that guy, if you call me that, then that's what I want to be, and we need to learn to start identifying each other with something positive. Some godliness. So when you see somebody at church here, you don't know what they're going through. They may be at the verge of giving up their faith. Tell them that they're men of God or women of God. Tell them that they're beautiful. Tell them that they're faithful. Come on, faithful person. Even if they're not, they will inspire to be that. Let's change the way we are dental. He says, man of God. Paul continues and he says, flee from all this. What is he talking about? Flee from, flee from running after money. Flee from running after other things. Idols. Flee from the worries that come with those sort of things. He's saying flee from them. What do you do when you flee? What does it mean to flee? It means run for your life. It means you are in mortal danger. You see, we read these things and go, oh, let's flee, blah, blah, blah. No, we're saying flee. Get out of there. You're chasing after the wrong things. Get out of there. You're in danger. You see, when we're drifting and wondering, we say to ourselves, it's okay, I'm just drifting and I'm wondering. I'm drifting. It's like, it's like a ship in the harbor. Like if I'm a ship and the anchor, and my anchor is on Jesus the rock and the harbor is the kingdom of God, one day you wake up and you've drifted a bit and you look back and you say, it's okay, I can still see the harbor. It's all, we're good, we're good. And then the next day you wake up and you're a little bit further back and say, it's okay, I can still see the harbor. And the next day, oh, it's getting a bit smaller. 
but I can still see it. It's okay. And then one day you wake up, you can't see anything except the horizon. You don't know where you are. You're lost. You're shipwrecked. That's why he says, flee. You don't realize what you're doing. You see, we think we're, we're drifting. You're not drifting. You're actually pursuing. Flee from what you pursue because anything that money, if you're pursuing money, you're not drifting from God. You are pursuing. Something within you is dragging you away and you are going in that direction. You want that. You want the other things. You want those things for your life. So it's not so easy just to turn around and say, it's okay, I'm going to turn around. You are pursuing with all your heart. What does Jesus say about this? He says, no one can serve two masters. And listen to what this, he says, either you will, ta- you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. So he's telling us something totally different when you pursue other things. And we call it drifting. We call it black, black, backsliding. It's not. That is why he says, flee. That is why he says, you are in danger. It's not only the things that we chase. There's inner desires that are calling us there. The sin wells up, and, and the more we drift from, from the presence of God, the more the, the, the flesh rises up. And then you've got the devil who's, who's there too saying, come on, you're on the right direction. Keep on going. This is good for you. You've got everything working against you. Let's call it what it is. You are risking eternal life with God when you are drifting and pursuing other stuff. You always have this premise, I can return when I want to, but that's not necessarily true. He says, flee. Run for your life. And you might say, what am I pursuing? I don't even really know. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm away from God a bit, but I, I wouldn't say I'm pursuing anything. Well, then stop. Stop and think. Ask yourself, why are you not coming to church anymore? Ask yourself, why are you not reading the Word of God anymore? Ask yourself, why are you not praying? Ask yourself, why are you not fellowshipping? And you will find the reason why, because you're doing something else. There's always something else that we're doing instead of honoring God and being with Him. We're very quiet. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Woohoo! Have you ever got physically lost? Anybody got physically lost in a city or something? Most of us, right? Recently, um, recently, I. I myself and um, my daughter and my son, we went to London and we got lost so many times. The, the subways there, the tubes are just a nightmare. It's just very difficult. There's a story of a young child that's lost in London. I'll read it to you. It says, at the heart of the city of London is Charing Cross. All distances across the city are measured from this central point. Locals refer to it simply as the cross. One day a child became lost in the bustling metropolis A bobby came to the child's aid and tried to help him to return to his family. He asked him so many questions, but to no avail. And finally, the child, with tears and sobbing, says, If you can just take me back to the cross, I think I can find my way home. You see, the only place that we can go when we are drifting or pursuing is back to the cross. Back to the place that you started. Where did you start? Where did you meet Jesus Christ? At the foot of the cross. Wasn't that the place where you found him? Wasn't that the place where you said, God, I'm committed to you. I'll be with you forever. You have to go back to the cross. You have to get back on your knees and say, forgive me, God. Please draw me in. And I'll tell you what, you do not find a God there with an angry finger. You find a God who's been waiting for you. 
You find a God who says, I leave the 99 and I go to search and rescue the one that's got lost. I leave the 99 because they obey my word, but this one has got lost. For whatever reason, he doesn't care. I'm going to find that person. I'm going to find that sheep. I'm going to carry it on my shoulders so that the lions and the bears don't kill it, and I will bring it back. That is the God that we worship. Where the prodigal son went and disappeared and spent all his inheritance of his dad who had been working so hard, where was the dad waiting every day at the gate for his son? Not with a finger but with a robe to say, son, you were lost, but now you are found. But what happens very often, Pastor Paul will say this, we we have people come and they give their life, they recommit their lives to Jesus and it's wonderful, we love it. We love salvation in the house, right? That's why we're here. We want to see people come into the presence of God. We want to see people come into eternity. We love it. But then two weeks later, they don't come back. What happened? They have a void because they've been pursuing something, and then they stop it, but the void is still there, and the apostle Paul tells us what to do. He says, rather swap your your, your passion for that and change your passion for this. He says, he says, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue endurance, and pursue gentleness. Because once you start to pursue those things, then you realize how good life is. Then you realize how precious life is. Oh, how would it be if we as a church pursued God as much as we pursue other things. We wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to watch the World Cup rugby. Right? But we don't wake up to to pray at 3 o'clock in the morning. We love other things and we pursue them with such reverent favor. And we think we've done our duty because we pitched up at church on Sunday morning. No, God wants you to pursue Him. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith. Pursue love. Pursue endurance and gentleness. Go from hot to cold. Don't end up lukewarm in the middle. Give your heart another reason to be passionate. Swap your desires with your passion. It's an interesting thing because we say when people give their lives to the Lord, they, we, we call it commitment, right? We say he recommitted or they committed. But the word committed by nature means I'm in for life. That's what it means. Let's commit to Jesus Christ. Let's recommit to Jesus Christ. Not for a day, not for a month, for a lifetime. And then the Apostle Paul says this. He says, fight the good fight of faith. You see, we we say that Christianity is a journey, right? Maybe in a way it is, but I believe it's more of a fight. Because when you give your life to Jesus Christ, immediately the devil's against you. You give your life to Jesus Christ, immediately the sin rises up in you. And you start to do the things that you don't want to do and you don't do the things that you want to do. When you were, before you were with Christ, the devil was like, tick, he's okay, let him go on his way. No trouble, just let him go. He's going to destruction, it's good. But as soon as you become a Christian, you put on your army suit. You're an army, you're a soldier of Christ. You have to go to war. You have to fight the good fight of faith. You cannot exist without fighting. You have to fight yourself. The Apostle Paul says, I don't shatter box. I don't sort, oh, yeah, but yo, 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 I never get hit. I never, nothing ever hits me. He says, I beat my body. I make my body listen to my will, listen to my faith. I tell my body I will not sin. I will not do it. I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I will not do it. I, I beat my body. You have to go to fight. There's three good fights of faith. The first one is this. You need to fight with God. Did you just say that, David? 
What did Jacob do? He wrestled with God. You want to be blessed? Wrestle with God. Wrestle with God. If you don't have your blessing, start wrestling with God. This is what it says here. Then the man, which we know is the angel, is probably Jesus, probably God, said, let me go for it's daybreak. He's fighting with an angel. He's fighting with Jesus. He won't let him go. He says, let him go. And he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He answered. Then the man said, your no name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. You want to change your destiny? Start wrestling with God. The second good fight is this. Start fighting yourself. As I just said, the Apostle Paul said, start beating the things into line that you want to. You, you, it's a struggle and you have to fight it. It's not easy. Sin rises up. It's so easy to go with it, but you have to fight it. Whenever we sin, we always feel terrible about it. Why? Why do we feel terrible about it? Because we know we should have fought. And when you fight and, and you get over it, you feel good about yourself. You're like, I can do this with your help, Jesus. I lean on you and I come to you and I can defeat it. I can defeat myself, my inner desires, and I can defeat the enemy. And that's the third good fight. Fight the enemy. He's always there to entice you to take something that you shouldn't be taking. And you know what? He's happy to give them to you. He said to Jesus uh, in, in the desert, he said, all of this, and I'm paraphrasing, all of this, all the glory of the heavens, everything you can have, it's yours. You have control and power and rule over it all if you bow down to me. And Jesus said, nah, nah, it's mine anyway. I own it. <laughs> Jesus said, I know it's mine. And guess what? Guess what? It's also yours. You're an heir of the sovereign Lord, are you not? Do you not inherit what God has given you? It's yours too. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to take it. You just stay with God and it's yours. God says. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I think I didn't put my stopwatch on. I think I'm running a bit late. Am I okay? I'm concluding anyway. It's good. Finally, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. You were called to this eternal life. God calls all men and women to eternal life. When you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Do you remember when you first gave your life to Jesus Christ, what that felt like? I remember so well. I was so emotional. I was like sobbing. <laughs> so wonderful. It was so joyful, but I was tearful. It was amazing. It was amazing to find Jesus Christ. And, and, and literally... Literally, the scales fell from my eyes and I suddenly could see a spiritual world. I could suddenly see who God was. I remember it so well. You know, as I'm getting older, I find that my faith is less about me and more about other people. And I'm not saying that you have to be old to do that. You can be young to do that. But this is just what my walk's been. And I, and I've, I find that I, I have this deep desire to see salvation to people. I, you know, and God's given me opportunities now and that I can do it. And I share with people wherever I go. But I'm, I literally am passionate about people receiving Christ. I want people to experience the wonder of Jesus Christ. Do you know, that the Bible says that God's nature is love. That's who God is, His love. And I think that we don't understand what this means because when Jesus comes, we all say, oh, come Jesus, come. No, 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 you don't want Jesus to come because on the day that He comes, it's going to be a terrible day. 
a terrible day for people. You don't want to be around to see that. And you certainly don't want to be here. Because on that day, love will go. Do you know how much love infiltrates our lives? It's not because we love our family. Everything, I love that view. Beautiful. No, you won't be loving the view anymore. I love food. No, you won't be loving food anymore. I love my family. No, you won't be loving your family anymore. Love will be gone. Joy will be gone. Why do you think it says there will be gnashing of teeth? There's no joy in gnashing of teeth. Once love is gone, it's gone. And so there's, there's this... You can be one or two people. You can be somebody that questions God all your life. Or you can be one that gives answers for God to people who question. Who do you want to be? You can run without the baton and disqualify yourself. Or you can take hold of the baton of eternity and run with it like a winner. Take hold of the eternal life that God gives you. Not just grab it. Take hold of it. Don't let it go. It's yours. Keep it. Don't let anybody snatch it from you. Don't let the devil snatch it from you. Don't let yourself snatch it from you. You keep it and you hold on to that eternal life. You make sure that God comes first. You make sure that God is the highest value in your life. Can we stand, please? I just want to pray first, and then I want to give um, an opportunity for salvation this morning. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the grace that is over this nation, over this people, this earth. How wonderful your grace is, God. How good your grace is. That even when we look up at you and we curse you, Lord, your grace still falls down on us. Oh, Lord God, please, Jesus. May we be a nation, may we be a church that turns our face to you. And that we can call ourselves men of God, women of God, child of God, children of God. Lord, I lift up this congregation to you. And I ask for your favor and your blessings over each one. I pray, Lord God, that you fill them with the passion of the Lord. That you fill them with, with a passion and a zeal that they're not even too sure how it came there. That there suddenly would be this desire to want more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.